Trash, Part 3, Chapter 3. Olivia, and yes, I know, it was stupid. The taxi took me into a part of the city that was more squalid than I'd ever seen. You may say that's strange coming from someone who works in Bihala, but it's not. Bihala is a huge, monstrous, filthy, steaming rubbish dump, and you cannot believe human beings are allowed to work there, let alone live there. Rubbish and shacks, it's extreme, it's horrible, and I will never forget the stink. Bihala also makes you want to weep, because it looks so like an awful punishment that will never end, and if you have any imagination, you can see the child and what he is doomed to do for the rest of his life. When you see the old man, too weak to work, propped in a chair outside his shack, you think, that is Raphael in 40 years. What could possibly change? These children are doomed to breathe the stink all day, all night, sifting the effluent of the city. Rats and children, children and rats, and you sometimes think they have pretty much the same life. Kova, however, was something else again. We drove on a cracked roads. The pavements were broken, and it looked as if they'd, or there'd recently been an earthquake. We drove between low-rise flats, strewn with washing and electricity cables. There were people everywhere, mainly sitting as if they had nothing ever to do. The taxi airs... The taxi's aircon wasn't working, and it was getting hotter and hotter. This was the dry season, but there was talk of a freak typhoon coming in from the sea. There was real heat in the breeze. We turned, and on our right was a high concrete wall. Gardo said, prison, and pointed, but you did not need to be told. There were coils of barbed wire at the top, some of it straggling down where it had come loose from its moorings. There were guard towers every fifty paces, open to the sun and rain. We turned right and followed the next wall. On the left were huts of bamboo and straw and more people, many of them tiny children. I always noticed the tiny children sitting in the dirt, playing with stones and sticks. I learned later that many of the families in these shacks had relatives as inmates on the other side of the wall. They had to live there and get food in, or the prisoner would starve. We came round to the entrance, and I paid off the taxi. Then I walked up to the guardhouse. It was a concrete box with a large window. Several guards sat inside. Beside it was a red and white barrier to stop vehicles and a man with a machine gun. I showed my passport and delivered the speech I had prepared. They made a phone call. I noticed that Gardo was holding my hand, and I, too, was scared. We were kept waiting for no more than two minutes, and another officer came to the window and asked me to repeat what it was I wanted. I told the story twice because another person arrived and then my passport was taken away. I was given a register to sign and a visitor badge. Gardo got one, too. Then we were led around the barrier and across a yard. To walk into a prison is a very frightening thing because you cannot help but think, what if something goes wrong and they won't let me out? I was also thinking about that line, the line there has to be, and you have to cross, that separates freedom from complete incarceration. What door would it be that would swing open and shut again behind us? We were taken past an office into what looked like a large waiting room. There were benches all the way around, it, and we were invited to sit. Seconds later, a guard came to escort us out of the waiting room down a corridor. At the end of the corridor was an iron gate made of bars. It was unlocked for us, and we all walked through, and it closed with that dreadful, clanging, ringing slam of metal on metal. We were shown to a smaller waiting room and asked to sit. We sat there for nearly an hour. You don't get anywhere in this country by showing impatience. I learned that very quickly here. It is so much better to wait and smile and nod. Gardo said almost nothing. I could see his lips moving as if he was saying a prayer. Out of the blue, he said to me, What is in memoriam? I said, I think it's Latin. When somebody dies, you write that, and it means in memory of. I asked him why he wanted to know. He smiled at me and said, Video game. Then he started muttering again as if he was reciting the same long prayer. Eventually, the door opened, and a man in a short sleeve shirt came in. He had a very warm smile, and he shook my hand and introduced himself as Mr. Ol Oliva. I told him my name was Olivia, and it seemed to break the ice instantly. He assured me that Mr. Oliva would help Miss Olivia if he possibly could. He had a photocopy of my passport in his hand, and he sat opposite me. He was quietly spoken and so polite and apologized for keeping me waiting. 
I'm the social welfare officer, he said. The governor is busy with some problems at the moment, or he would see you himself. We always try to accommodate these re requests. The inmate you wish to see, he does get these requests quite often. You've given us his number, but it's not the right number. Are you quite sure it's Mr. Alondris that you want to see? I think so, I said. Yes, please, sir, said Gardo, Gabriel Alondris. Like I say, he does get visitors, and it is always keen to see them. You know he's a very sick man? Gardo nodded at me, and I said, yes. There was a silence. It's one of the reasons we're here, I said. It is not out of the question, said Mr. Oliva. There are some formalities, however. Usually we can set these things up all the better if we have some notice, you see. You could come next week, maybe? I shook my head. I'm very sorry, I said. I could feel Gardo's panic. He could sense we were close to success. I'm embarrassed, in fact. This is my friend Gardo, and he only told me about the problems yesterday, and he says it's urgent. I think it's incredibly kind of you to even consider seeing us. Mr. Oliva smiled. You are very patient and very educated. You are a social worker, yes? And Bahala? I'm an unpaid worker. It's completely voluntary. Mr. Oliva extended his hands and shook mine firmly. Thank you, he said. Without people coming to help like this, things would be worse than they are. This city has many problems. Every city has problems. But maybe this city has more than most. I don't know. You are looking after this boy? I said, he was very upset yesterday. I didn't understand everything, but he told me I might be able to do something. Is he a good boy? Yes. He goes to your school? Not as often as I would like, I said, and Mr. Oliva laughed. He exchanged a few words with Gardo and patted his arm. You know the man you wish to see in, is in the hospital at the moment? I don't know very much about him, I said, except what Gardo told me. Oh, he's not a well man. I think you might be upset. Also, the conditions, the meeting area. You've been in a prison before? I shook my head. Mr. Oliva smiled. You see, our government has many pressing problems. It does not put money into its prisons. I think the same was true in your country a hundred years ago. I think you will be upset by what you see. Perhaps just the boy should come. If it's between him and Mr. Alondris? Uh, I think I ought to be with him, I said. I didn't know why. I was getting frightened again, but having come this far, would I really sit in the waiting room? This was my year of seeing the world, and it occurred to me that to see the world of Bihala, and now a jail, perhaps it would teach me more than I'd ever found at university. Mr. Oliva said, The problem is the fees. To organize a visit like this, to fast track, so to speak, they told you at the gate? They didn't, I said. They were embarrassed, he replied. It is a question of getting security clearance. We have to send somebody very fast for approval. We could get a waiver if you gave us some time. He looked so honest. Is it really so urgent, he said. I nodded. I can check in a moment, he said, but I think it will be 10000 And a receipt with a governor so busy, uh -uh. I don't need a receipt, I said. I must admit, I felt slightly sick. The day was costing me a fortune. The problem is, I'm not sure I'm carrying as much as that. Gardo was looking away. I'll get the forms and check, Mr. Mr. Oliva said. I want very much to help you, but I don't set the fees. They are set by the government, he smiled. I think the government must be very rich. Ten minutes later, he was back. He had a form in his hand. You will have to be photographed also, I'm afraid, and I was right. It is ten thousand. I was carrying 11000 I had been to the bank that morning and had withdrawn extra because I was meeting friends for dinner in a very expensive restaurant that night. In half an hour, they had made a security pass for me with my photograph and a number of signatures. Mr. Oliva shook my hand again. As he left, he called out loudly, and in a moment, there were four guards in the corridor. One said something to Gardo, and he said, Come. I remember their echoing boots. We were led to another room with lockers. We were asked to take everything out of our pockets. We had to take off our shoes and shake them. They put everything inside and slammed the doors. We set off down another passageway, and I could hear people in the distance shouting. I knew the dividing line was close now, and my heart was beating fast. Sure enough, the quarter took us into a long hall, bisected, 
bisected by floor-to-ceiling bars, and the shouting of men was louder still, as if we were coming to some kind of marketplace. We were led to a gate in the center, and as the guards opened it, I became aware of the constant banging of metal on metal. Everywhere, doors were slamming, and I could hear the ratcheting of keys and locks. Suddenly, we were in a strange no-man's land, like a decompression chamber, a space in which the door behind us locked before the door in front was opened. Under all the shouting, there was laughter, and, I have to say it, it was like animal noise with a dreadful echo. It was also, if it were possible, getting hotter as if something was breathing on us. Orders were shouted, everyone was suddenly in a hurry. That final door was unlocked, and we were beckoned through. Welcome, cried the guard receiving us. He smiled at me, a smile of genuine interest and warmth, which seemed so wrong for the hall, for the hell we were walking.